everyone, welcome back for more Bio 241. We're in week number 11 where we're going to look at circulatory mechanisms. In particular today we're going to look at heart function and blood vessels. Brief outline along with our outcomes. So last time we looked at the basic structure of circulation in terms of pathways and heart structure. Reminded you a little bit from anatomy. What separates the atria from the ventricle is what we call the fibrous skeleton of the heart. And what we end up seeing as part of that fibrous skeleton are some valves. Valves allow for one-way flow. Those valves are going to be what we call the atrioventricular valves. On the left side of the heart, it has two flaps. We call that the bicuspid, sometimes called the mitral valve. On the right side of the heart, we see three flaps, and we call that the tricuspid. Here we see the valves, so they're closed, and if I were to look underneath, there are flaps that hang down, and they're attached to the heart muscle through some tendons called cordy tendony, and then those are attached to heart muscle called the papillary muscles. As I exit the heart and enter into the arteries, we actually get some flaps made out of the endothelium of those arteries. We name these valves the aortic valve and the pulmonary valve or the pulmonic valve. These just turn out to be folds in the endothelium and they work in the exact same way, except the way that they fit together, they actually don't end up using cordy tendony because they're actually tight enough that they actually don't require it. What we end up hearing is when these valves close, we get auscultation, which is to say we hear heart sounds. Heart sounds are lub-dub, when the AV valves close, we get a lub sound. When the semilunar valves close, we get a dub sound. Typically, we should only hear, if we're listening to the heart, you should only hear these closing, lub dub, lub dub, lub dub. If you're really good, you can actually hear them opening and flow going through. Those are called sounds S3 and S4, but that's not common. If these valves do not completely close due to some type of defect or we have some type of inflammation that's preventing it, we might get some backflow and we call that sound a murmur. <clears throat> to get those valves to close, we need to play around with the pressures. And if I look, we need to actually have some type of mechanism that controls the contractions of the heart. Certain parts of the heart muscle is actually are capable of contracting quicker or depolarizing quicker than other parts. If I look at the SA node or the sinoatrial node, this is actually an embryonic structure and it turns out to be the portion that actually depolarizes faster than anywhere else in the heart. For that reason, we refer to it as the pacemaker. And the only thing that kind of overrides it are what we call ectopic pacemakers, other cells that happen to to depolarize rather, rather quickly. When the SA node fires, it's going to then send a contraction signal out. That's going to spread from the SA node out using those intercalated discs. If you recall, there are certain muscle cells that are better at conducting than they are contracting. And what they're going to do is send signals out into the atria so that the atria contract more or less together. And when they contract together, that is them fulfilling their role as a syncytium, which is to say they contract as a unit. They're going to get blocked, however, at the fibrous skeleton of the heart. So the atria will contract and that will be it. The signals are actually going to pool at a second node that we call the atrioventricular node. And this node is going to be the second quickest depolarizing portion of the heart it actually will be able to pierce the um, fibrous skeleton and it will transfer into the, interventricular into the interventricular septum. When I move from the SA node to the AV node, it moves through a series of conductive cells and we call those Bachmann's bundles. From the AV node, it's going to pass through this passageway that we call the bundle of Hiss. It's going to go through these bundle branches, going through the interventricular septum. They hit the apex of your heart, and then they kind of rebound up the sides of the heart in the myocardium. And we call these fibers that move on up into the lateral portions of the ventricles Purkinje fibers. 
What this ends up allowing is we'll have a depolarization in the atria. They contract. We send the signal down to the apex of the heart and reverb up. And that will allow the contraction to go from the apex upwards. And that pushing upwards when they contract will close the AV valves, push open the semilunar valves, and eject blood from the heart. We can look at the electrodynamics of what's going on in the heart, and it turns out to be rather unique of all the, all the muscle types. When we look at the action potentials, which <laughs> can be influenced from one of two places, the sympathoadrenal system, meaning the sympathetic division of the autonomic nervous system, or the adrenal gland, could speed it up. Or we could just deal with the pacemaker itself. They're going to be involved with the actual contractions. So during a depolarization, we'll have sodium influxing. What we then get is when we should get our depolar or our repolarization, we actually get a slow influx of calcium ions. They're going to come from the CSF and from the SR. And that influx is actually going to cause a slowdown. So we should be having a depolarization, but because we're leaking in calcium ions, it's fighting against the depolarization. So sodium influx, depolarize. We should have the potassium ions leaving, and we should have our rapid depolarization. But because calcium ion is also coming on in, it's going to slow down the depolarization. <coughs> the result is we make this kind of plateau that shows up. This plateau is going to prolong the repolarization, and it's going to also prolong the muscle contraction, which makes sense because we want to squeeze all the blood possible out of the ventricles. What we'll then do is when we repolarize, we need to bring this calcium ion back out of the cell, so put it either extracellularly or into the SR. We're going to do that through three different mechanisms. We're going to have a, an SR ATPase, so that's what we call the circa pump. So circa standing for the um, sarcoplasmic or endoplasmic reticulum calcium ATPase. At the plasma membrane, we're going to have a sodium ion and calcium ion exchanger, so an antiport system. We also have a calcium ion ATP pump that's going to remove calcium ions. And again, this actually prolongs the contraction before we hit the full-blown repolarization, which is essential for heart function. We can actually track the electrical activity, and we call that the ECG, or an electrocardiogram. And here's the pattern that we see. When the atria go through and they have their depolarization, we call this structure the P wave. After the P wave, we end up getting the atria to contract. We refer to that as atrial systole. Strictly speaking, the P wave would be the depolarization of the atria, but we can simplify it and say it's atrial systole, although technically that would be afterwards, but let's just go with it anyway. After a depolarization, we need to have the atria repolarize. So when they repolarize, this is going to occur at about the same time that we get depolarization within the ventricles. This is going to cause a, a rather odd complex to form, what we call the QRS complex. This is because there's lots of things going on at the exact same time. We have the repolarization of the atria, and we have this odd directionality to what's going on in the ventricles. And that's going to lead to what we call ventricular systole. When the atria are in relaxation mode, we call that atrial diastole. After all this, the atria are going to, or excuse me, the ventricles are going to be capable of repolarizing, and we call this period ventricular diastole. So we have the P wave, QRX, T wave. That would be a complete um, ECG. And it is an insanely good uh, diagnostic tool for the heart. We can actually use it to determine heart rate. So if I were to measure the time from P wave to P wave, or R to R, or T wave to T wave, or whatever, same point to same point, between two successive beats, 
and measure that time, we can actually use that to determine cardiac rate. Obviously, the blood needs to leave the heart, and that's when it's going to enter into blood vessels. Here, we actually have several blood vessel types to look at. There's five, and we're going to look at them very superficially because you saw them in detail when you took anatomy. The arteries, which actually divide into several categories, we're going to just clump them all together as to being what we call elastic, fibre, elastic meaning they are capable of stretching and then recoiling back. These are going to be useful in maintaining blood pressure. The small version of an artery is called an arteriole, and these have proportionately more smooth muscle than do any of the arteries. And because they have more smooth muscle, they're going to be capable of contracting more. And that contraction can be used to divert blood into different pathways. After an arteriole, we're going to get the smallest style of blood vessel, which is called the capillary. There are several versions of these, what we call a continuous capillary or a fenestrated capillary. Main difference is fenestrated has these tiny holes, so they're going to be porous, which is better for exchange, but it's not as selective. You have roughly 40 billion capillary beds in your body, which ends up giving you a massive cross-sectional area. We're going to need that later on and they're actually the site of fluid exchange. In order to bring the blood back, we have to move through veins. The fancy word for a small vein is called a venule. And these venules are going to have famous for having valves in them, and that's because these are low pressure systems and we need to prevent blood flow from moving backwards. You also see that in medium sized veins, but the large veins, you're not going to see that. They, they won't, they're not going to have valves. These turn out to usually be found between uh, skeletal muscles, and that's going to be helpful in returning blood to the heart. This is an example of a capillary bed that shows all of the blood vessel types. So we'll have an artery, and we'll have the arterioles coming away. Part of these arterioles, there will be some what we call meta-arterioles, which can form these little shunts. These will have what we call precapillary sphincters, which are going to be smooth muscle, and that's going to help regulate the flow of blood across from one side to the other. The smallest of these vessels will be capillaries. So we'll go from big to small to smaller to smallest. And here's where exchange will occur. We'll then move into larger structures. We'll call these venules, and then eventually back into a vein. As previously noted, we usually find veins between skeletal muscles, and that's because we're going to use, instead of the heart to drive the pressure, we're going to use skeletal muscles to be the pressure source. So when skeletal muscles contract, what they will do is squeeze blood, and that's going to push blood out from in between. The lower valve is going to prevent flow, but will push blood up into the next segment. So when the muscles relax, we actually slam both of them shut, but when we contract again, we'll push blood up. And the result is blood moves in stages from valve to valve to valve to valve. Eventually, once we get up near where your diaphragm is, we're going to use intrathoracic pressure to pull the blood up to your heart and up, up on in. So once we get to your basically liver and diaphragm, so where your lungs would be, we don't need to rely on valves anymore. But everywhere else, we've got to rely on valves. These valves actually might become loosened, and we can see them bulging out in a few places in your body. We call those bulges varicosities. They're famous in the rectum. There we refer to those as hemorrhoids. We can get them on the backs of your calves, and we call those, of course, varicose veins. They also happen inside of your esophagus. When we look at blood volume, speaking of capillaries, remember that blood's going to be around 45% cells, so the, re the rest is going to be fluid. Um, most of that fluid is water, and we need to move that fluid back and forth because the fluid 
the watery part, the plasma, is going to be where we have all of our nutrients. The only real source of massive shuffling that we get will be between your blood plasma and the interstitial fluid. Then from that interstitial fluid, we can then shuffle it into a cell, or we can move fluids from your cells into the interstitium, into your bloodstream. There's a little bit of exchange between the GI tract and the interstitial fluid, but even then, it's limited. So what we're going to want to do is control this flow of water back and forth. And the way that we do that is primarily at capillary beds. We're actually going to utilize osmosis to do this, and we're going to use two aspects of it. One is going to be a fluid pressure, so a physical push. We're also going to use osmotic pressures, which are going to be poles. And these poles are going to be due primarily due via proteins. The reason why we like to have this under control is if it's not in balance, you run the risk of swelling up or an edema, or you could have a drop in blood pressure, which we call shock. Capillary exchange will result in one of two things. One is called filtration, which is fluid leaving the capillaries, or absorption, fluid entering the capillaries. And there are some pressures that are involved, and I thought I fixed this. I didn't. Shame on me. So we have what are known as hydrostatic pressures, and these are pushing pressures. And this is going to push, this is the blood pushing fluid, or the interstitial fluid pushing. Bl the blood hydrostatic pressure is going to push for filtration. Interstitial pressure is going to force absorption. The osmotic pressure in these P's here actually should be pi's, so I have that incorrectly. I will fix that. I apologize. These are going to be osmotic, so they're going to be pulling pressures. So the plasma colloid, so colloid is a fancy word for proteins. So plasmoid, or the plasma colloid osmotic pressure, is going to be proteins inside of your bloodstream pulling water on in. So this is going to be an absorption pressure. And tissue colloid osmotic pressure is going to be proteins in the tissues pulling water out. And this is going to be a filtration pressure. When I look at all of these, for the most part, these stay more or less the same. The blood pressure is going to be the big change. Interstitial, plasma colloid, and tissue colloid, these don't change too much. But the blood pressure change, the blood hydrostatic pressure, that's going to be the one that actually fluctuates. So what do we see? Filtration will happen when we get the um, hydrostatic colloid pressure, or the hydrostatic, the blood hydrostatic pressure, and the interstitial osmotic pressure exceeding the interstitial hydrostatic and the plasma oncotic or plasma osmotic pressures. And then you switch it around for absorption. This process here is essential for any type of exchange. We notice that on the arterial side, we get net filtration. On the venous side, we get net absorption. The main difference between them is going to be a drop in pressure, but we also see a slight change in protein concentration, but it's primarily going to be driven by blood pressure changes. The catch is the filtration and the absorption are not the same. We're actually going to lose something on the order of one to two liters a day if we don't actually balance this out. So the filtration is more than the absorption, and we need to balance this. And the slight difference is enough to kill you in a day. So we need to have a system to reclaim that fluid. We drew out capillary exchange. And that system that we're going to use are called lymphatics. So these lymphatics tissues are going to be blind, quote, capillaries, unquote. They're not really capillaries, but they're, they, they're shaped like them. And what they're going to be able to do is they're going to be porous, and they're going to be able to reabsorb liquid that's at the area. We call that lymph. That lymph is going to be brought to lymph nodes where they'll be in, inspected, then eventually dumped into lymph ducts which will be returned into general circulation. 
There are several mechanisms to bring lymph back. They have their own smooth muscles, so they have peristaltic motion. They're also going to be found between skeletal muscles, yada yada. They're also famous because cancer can spread through lymphatics. In some people, lymph vessels have to be removed, like if you have a radical mastectomy. So the way that you actually have to bring this fluid back is you actually have to apply an external pressure. So you have to artificially increase the interstitial hydrostatic pressure, and that's just a pressure sleeve. And that actually draws fluid back in. 